In this video, we're going to do a deep dive into the Unity and Logo effect created in the Visual Effect Graph. This is part of the official samples, and it's a great showcase of millions of particles behaving independently. We're going to inspect the graph and see how it actually works. Let's begin! Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and this channel is all about helping you learn how to make your own games with in-depth tutorials made by a professional indie game developer. So if you find the video helpful, consider subscribing. Okay, so here we're going to look at the Unity and Logo effect from the official Unity Visual Effect Graph samples. There's a link in the descriptions where you can grab the samples and try them out for yourself. And if you're not familiar with the Visual Effect Graph, then check out my Getting Started video. All right, so here's the effect in action. There's a sphere moving around spawning particles, and in the background, you can see that those spawned particles take on the shape of the Unity logo. Each particle, as you can see, is individually simulated, which showcases the power of the Visual Effect Graph. Doing something like this with this many particles is simply not doable with the old particle system. This video is made possible thanks to these awesome supporters. Go to patreon.com slash unitycodemonkey to get some perks and help keep the videos free for everyone. So it's a great looking effect, let's see how it works. Okay, so here in the project files we have our samples, then we have the Unity logo, and let's open up the Unity logo effect. All right, here is the entire graph. Now, while the effect is actually very impressive, it's actually one of the simpler ones. So the effect is essentially built in just two parts. So there's a sphere moving around that acts as the spawn position for the particles, and there's a vector field in the shape of the Unity logo, which is where the particles are attracted to. So everything else is just adding more randomization and color to those two actions. So let's first look at how the logo is done. Now, like I said, it's using a vector field. A vector field is a field containing vectors like you might see, for example, on a weather map showing wind direction. So that would be a 2D vector field. And a 3D vector field is essentially a cube made up of voxels where each voxel contains a vector pointing in a certain direction. And in this case, all of those vectors are built pointing to the shape of the Unity logo. So those vectors are what the particles use to move. In Unity, you can store a vector field as a 3D texture or as a .vf file. So here in this folder, you have the Unity logo. And as you can see, it's a texture of 64 by 64 by 64 with the RGB. Okay, now in order to analyze the logo effect, let's just quickly disable the sphere. So in here, I'm going to disconnect this sphere connection. And there you go, now the sphere is just on the middle and also disable the collision, and let's disable the gradient. So now the particles spawn as white. And down here, let's also disable the blend color. All right, so now we can focus solely on inspecting how the logo works. Now here in the update, we can see that we have three update blocks. Now the first one is colliding with the spear, so that one's already disabled. Now the second one, we can also disable for now. And the third one is the one that has the actual shape of the Unity logo. So here you can see that this block is of type vector field force. So it's applying a force to each particle based on a vector field. Now the vector field is in here being selected with this exposed property. So looking in the blackboard, we can see the vector field property is a texture 3D and it's set to this one here with the Unity logo. And since this one is exposed, we can also select the VFX game object and open up the inspector. And in here we have our vector field. So since this one is exposed, we could also overwrite this and select a different one. Now the other input here is for the field transform. So these are essentially the transformations that are applied on top of the vector field. So right now it's attached to a property, but we can break this off. And now we can play around and manually modify these values. So for example, we can modify the scale to make it really tiny. So make it just one, one, one. And if there you go, look at that effect, now it's extremely tiny. So essentially we're modifying the size of the vector field. And again, the vector field is the thing that actually attracts the particles. So we can modify anything of this, like for example, modify the X and there you go, it starts moving to the side. Modify the Y to move it up and down. And we can also rotate it, yep, just like that. So all of these transformations are applied on top of the vector field. So let's connect this property again. So connect this one to this one. And now let's see how this property is working because this one is actually extremely interesting. So we have this property and in the blackboard, we can see that it's of type transform. And then we can inspect on the inspector, our game object. And here we can see indeed we have a vector field transform. And now for the really interesting part is down here attached to this game object is another script of type VFX property binder. And this is how you can link a VFX property with a normal game object. So here we can select this property binding 
and we can bind this property to this target. And this target takes a transform, which is an object in our scene. So instead of modifying these values individually, we can add a property binder, we'll link a field with a transform, and now we can modify this transform. So here in the scene view, and we can just move it. And yep, there you go, you can see that the effect is actually moving. So by modifying this game object, you can see that we are updating our effect in real time. Now what makes this super cool is how you can easily animate your effects by animating a basic game object. So in fact, that's exactly what's being used as we play the scene. Here with the scene playing, you can see that there is a slight rotation left and right. And none of that is done by actually modifying the effect, but rather just by animating that linked object. So here in the scene, there's a timeline game object and we can inspect the timeline and see that, yep, indeed, there it is. We have our transform proxy and it's being animated on the rotation. So it rotates left, rotates right. And by animating that object, then our effect gets animated as well. So binding transforms in your scene to transform properties in your effects is a really excellent and easy way of adding some awesome animations. All right, so that's pretty much how the Unity logo works. It's just a vector field attracting particles. Now here on the update, you can see that there is also another vector field. So this one is essentially just applying some noise. So for example, let's disable the one with the Unity logo. And right now we don't see anything. And now if we enable this one, yep, there you go. Now you can see it's pretty much just random noise. So it's a vector field sending all the particles in all different directions. And now here you can also see that there are some nodes attached to it. And all it's really doing is it's taking the total time, which is constantly increasing. Then it multiplies itself by a certain value and simply applies a result of that transformation onto our film transform rotation. So in there, you can see that the vector film is actually rotating constantly. So if you look in the scene, look from a different point of view. Yep, there you go. You can see the rotation happening. So in here, we can increase this. And yep, there you go. Now it's rotating faster. And if we were to disconnect this one, yep, there you go. Now you can see how the randomness is completely static. So with rotation, it looks a lot more interesting. All right, so this one is pretty much just that. It just adds a bit of noise. And then this one has the shape of the Unity logo. So when you combine both of them, Yep, there it is. It takes on the shape of the Unity logo while also keeping some rotation, making it feel very flowy. So that's the Unity logo part of the effect. Pretty much just a vector field and some randomness on top. Now for the visual, let's look down here on the output. Most of it is pretty standard. So it's just orienting particles along with their velocity. Then it sets a scale based on their current velocity. And then the one special thing down here is the color blend which is based on the particle lifetime, and it's also blending with another color based on the sphere position. So now it's time to look at the second main element, which is how the sphere works. Now up here, let's just reset the sphere connection. So connecting this sphere output onto that input. And yep, there you go. Now the sphere is moving around in our scene. And now let's just focus on the sphere. So in here, let's disable the vector fields and enable the sphere collision. And since the particle size is based on the velocity, right now we can't see anything. So let's just add a very tiny force. And up here, let's also set the lifetime to a tiny amount and increase how many are spawned. And here, just increase the AGR intensity. And yep, now we can visually very easily see all of our sphere moving. All right, now we can look into it. Now, the really interesting thing is how all of this movement is handled solely through these nodes down here. So like we saw previously, it's possible to create some movement by linking a moving game object and acting as the input for the sphere or transform. And now here we are seeing another approach of animating our effects, which is just using some basic math. So let's first analyze the part here on the left side. Now this one is really just a simple branch node. It uses a boolean to decide whether to use this value or this value. Now the difference here is that one is using the total time for the entire effect, and the other one is using the total time per each individual particle. So that's logic to it, however it doesn't really make much of a difference. But anyway, this whole group, that's all it's doing. All it does is it grabs the total time. Then over here is the group with the actual sphere movement. And now if you're familiar with math and trigonometry, then this will be very easy to understand. But even if you don't, you should still be able to get it. Now there are two parts to the sphere. There's the movement up here and the size down here. Now the size part is actually extremely simple. It's just these nodes. So you can see that we have a simple noise node. Now what it does is it generates some random values. In this case, it's generating those values in a single dimension. So imagine a noise image that is one pixel tall and each pixel is randomly going from black to white. All of these fields down here essentially manipulate how that noise is generated. Then our coordinate in here is the value that we're actually grabbing. So by using the time from down here as our coordinate, time is always increasing. So the coordinate is always increasing. So we're always getting a different value. And then the output from the noise here is going to be a value between zero and one. 
And then in here we have a LERP node. So this one interpolates a value between X and Y based on the input in here on the S. And for the inputs, we are getting them through this property. So we can expand it and see, yep, we have a property. It has an X and Y, which we are using to set the minimum and maximum size. So here in the blackboard, we can inspect this one. There it is, the sphere min max radius. It is a simple vector too. And again, it's exposed, so we can modify this in the inspector. So we select it. Down here, we have the sphere min max. For example, let's put this at 0.1 and this one at 1. And now the sphere goes from really big to really small. So we interpolate between the minimum and the maximum based on the noise. And then we simply input that onto the sphere radius. So all of these nodes down here are essentially just creating a nice pulsating effect. So as the sphere moves around, it also randomly becomes smaller and bigger. Now we can just disable the size pulsating so we can focus only on movement. So let's just disconnect the time in here. And yep, there you go. Now our coordinate is the same, so the size never changes. All right, so that's how the size is set up. Now let's look up here into how the movement works. Now the movement is handled entirely through all of these nodes. And now essentially it's all based on the sine and cosine waves. Now I'm not a mathematician, but if you're not familiar, here is a very basic explanation. The sine is a value calculated based on an angle. The sine goes from minus one to plus one. So if the angle is zero, then the sine will be zero. And if the angle is 90 degrees or one half of pi, then the sine will be plus one. And if it is at 270 degrees, then the sine is minus one. So if you picture a rotating angle, you end up with a nice wave function going constantly from minus one to plus one. And if you rotate the angle faster, then you essentially increase the frequency of the wave. And the cosine is pretty much the same thing, except instead of getting the opposite side of the triangle, it gets the adjacent. So all that matters is that it's a wave function that returns a value between minus one and one. So here we are using the sine in order to grab what will become the x, and we're using the cosine in order to grab what will become the y and the z. Now to simplify things, let's disconnect the cosine here. And yep, just like that, we can see our sphere moving simply left and right. So that's a sine wave at work. Now note here that we are applying a sine to a vector. So one thing that really tripped me up quite a bit while I was researching this was how sine works with vectors. I was thinking that it was essentially calculating the angle of the vector and then calculating the sine of that. However, that is not the case. What it does is individually calculates the sine for each of the x, y, and z, and it fills the output vector with the sine of those values. So in this case, we're only grabbing the output on the y, which is simply going to be the sine of the input on the y. So the input isn't really being used as a vector three, but rather as just three floats. Now in here, we can disconnect the sine from the time. And here you can see that if I modify the z, yep, nothing happens since we're not using it. Modify the x and yep, nothing happens either. It's only if I modify the y that, yep, you can see that it's going left and right. Now, again, another basic math thing, just in case you're confused. The number used in here to calculate the sine is represented in radians. So at zero, the output is zero. So the sphere is right down the middle. Then as we increase, you can see that it reaches the edge. Yep, just about that. So in order to get an output of plus one, then essentially we have to have the input of pi divided by two. So essentially 1.57. Then as we increase and we reach pi, which is 3.14, we go back into the middle. So the result is zero. And as we keep increasing, it goes to the left side. And at two pi, it goes back to zero. So just be aware that this one is using radians and not Euler angles. So it doesn't go from zero to 360, but rather from zero to two pi. All right, so that's the sine wave, which is outputting on the y value. But in here, it is combined into the x value with these other two. So the append vector is essentially just creating a vector. It takes this one as the x, then this one as its y, and this one as its z. So this one just creates the actual vector. Now in this vector, all of the fields are going to be between minus one and plus one. And then in here, we have a simple multiply where we're multiplying our vector by the sphere motion amplitude. Then the resulting vector from that simply goes into the sphere center, which is the sphere position. Now this effect is using two properties in here, the sphere motion speed and the motion amplitude. So now let's connect the sin back. Yep, there it is. Now these two properties are pretty straightforward. So if we look into the inspector, since those are exposed, yep, there you go, we have the sphere motion speed and the amplitude. So if we modify the speed, as we increase, yep, there you go, the sphere constantly moves faster and faster and faster. And by modifying the amplitude, we simply change how much it goes, in this case, left to right. So put it really small and barely moves. Yep, just like that. So two basic properties that we can interact to modify the effect. And now if we just connect the cosine, 
And yep, as you can see, it's mostly the same behavior, except it's moving up and down and back and forth. So that's pretty much how the home movement of the sphere works. The input is in here, increasing over time. Then it applies some wave functions to that value. It multiplies them by a certain speed and a certain amplitude, and simply uses it all in order to go to the center. So with this one, and let's also connect the pulsating effect, and yep, there's the sphere working exactly as it was. So you can see how you can animate things in your effect, either by animating a link game object or just by using some really clever math. So that's a sphere which is outputted in here and then it's used in various places. So the main one is the sphere goes in here into where the particles are spawned. Then it also goes into this block in here, which causes the particles to collide with the sphere. So if we disable this one, yep, there you go. You can see that they no longer collide. So as soon as they spawn, they are left behind. And finally, it also goes into this part down here, which creates some color blending. So let's see how this part works. So for that, let's enable our vector fields. So you enable this one in the shape of the Unity logo, and enable this one in the shape of the random vector field. And up here, let's reset the particle lifetime. And yep, there's our effect with the sphere moving around, as well as the Unity logo. So the particles get spawned on the position of the sphere as it moves, and they get attracted towards the Unity logo. Now, if you remember, up here we disconnected this gradient, so all the particles are being spawned as a simple white. But down here, if we enable the blend color over life, so enable this one, and yep, there you go, now you can see that the particles do take some color. So the color is in here on the blend, it uses this property which is exposed, and you can see that it's using this gradient. So each particle goes through all of these colors over its lifetime, that's going into this color input, and then it also has a very interesting color blend, so what this blending is doing in here is it's blending the color of the particles when the sphere passes over them. So in there you can slightly see that even though the particles are changing color, you can still see where the sphere is moving. Now the input in here is from the sphere as it moves, yep. Then we take that sphere input, we get the position of the current particle, and we do a simple distance compare it to the sphere center. Then we simply subtract the radius, and then we use that value in order to sample a specific value on a curve. So what this is doing is essentially if the particle is right on top of the sphere, then this node will output zero. And if the particle is too far away from the sphere, then it will output one. So we can break off this connection and manually modify this to see what happens. So if this one is at zero, then it's going to sample the curve right on the left side there. So the output in here will be zero, which means it will not blend with this color. So without blending, then the output color will simply be the one that it was spawned with. And if we change it to one, then it's essentially using this color, which is a gradient over the life of the particle. So the output from this one into this one will depend on the distance of the particle to the sphere. Then it grabs a position on this curve, and then it outputs in here. And depending on that, it either uses this color or the starting color. So if we connect this one back, and yep, there you go. Now they get spawned with a different color. And you can see how the effect of where the sphere goes over some particles, they go back into their original color. All right, so here is the full complete effect. It looks pretty complex, but hopefully now you understand how it's made up of a bunch of relatively simple systems all interacting with each other. This is a really good looking effect that works as an excellent sample to showcase the power of the visual effect graph. Again, remember how throughout all of this time we've been playing around with hundreds of thousands of particles and it's all running at a rock solid framework. So here it is, the effect looking really nice. Alright, so this was a bit of a different new type of video. This is the first time I've done a deep dive on an official sample provided by Unity. Let me know in the comments if you found this type of video useful. If so, then I may look into doing more deep dives into more effects as well as other Unity projects like the dot sample or the lost crypt. So let me know in the comments. This video is made possible thanks to these awesome supporters. Go to patreon.com slash unity codemonkey to get some perks and help keep the videos free for everyone. Subscribe to the channel for more Unity tutorials, post any questions in the comments, and I'll see you next time.